All right, it's time to get started here. As mentioned, uh, my name is Dave Donald. Um, I am going to, uh, I'm not gonna be uh, running the camera through the whole thing because you do not need to look at my incredibly attractive face during the presentation. But I just wanted to let you know that I am in fact live here. Those of you that have just joined us, as I mentioned, please go to the questions tab, type in the name of your dealership and the city and state from which you come. That would be fantastic. That will get us started here. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what we're going to go over today so you've got a feeling for this. First and foremost, we believe that there are things that are more critical than just the product as far as this entity of Origin Acoustics is concerned. So I wanna give you a little bit of background. I wanna give you some of our philosophy and then we'll go into a, a full product line overview. Uh, we will not be talking about the products that will be at Cedia at this point. Those are uh, some of those are are still secretive and embargoed until the show. Uh, when we get around that time here in the next month or so, you'll be able to see all of the new products, and there are quite a few of them that will be there. But today we'll go over the entire line and give you an idea. Now I'm also a firm believer in the fact that I don't want to, I don't need you to memorize every model number in order to be able to sell the line. That's very important. All of this information is available for you online. What I'm going to do is give you the overview of the product, explain how the product breaks down into its various sections, categories, and collections, so that you will know exactly what you need to do to be able to get out there and, and get a hold of the product that you need. So I will do that as well. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and shut off my lovely camera here and we will begin the presentation from here. Now, during the presentation, should you have a question, feel free to go ahead and type that into the question section because when we get to the end of the presentation, I will give you the opportunity, I'll go back and I will read through any of those questions and answer those first. If in fact we have uh, any questions that you do not want to ask in that form, I will open up the microphones at the end. That tends to get a little bit noisy, but at least we can field those questions as well. So with that, let me uh, go ahead and begin here. <clears throat> We have a, a mentality here that is critical to us, and that is to begin the entire process of creating, building, developing, and distributing product by starting with why we are doing it. Now, I am a believer that if, in fact, you start with a big enough why, you can accomplish just about anything. And my why happens to exist, and it looks a lot like this right here. <clears throat> I have 12 children. Um, the little one on the end is not mine. That is a grandchild. Thank you very much. But I have 12 children, all of which are not in this particular photograph because the last time we uh, got all 12 of them together, it was a long time ago. But anyway, every morning when I wake up, every time I slide out of bed and splash water on my face, it is because of this group right here. My wife and my children are my reason for existence. And so as I move through this uh, entire process, I have this huge why that grounds me in what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Well, at Origin Acoustics, we too began with this why. And the why that we were dealing with had to do with our clients and what our clients were looking for. Now, we have been together as a group, as a team, as it were, for, well, almost 30 years at this point in time. And I'll give you some history on that as we move forward. But the thing to realize in all of this is why we started. Why did we get involved? What was the entire purpose behind this? Well, the reason was because we had clients out there with big, beautiful homes who had a tremendous desire to have audio and video and, and home entertainment. And they wanted to be able to enjoy the benefits of it, but they didn't want to have to look at the product. That was a huge deal. They had these beautiful homes. They did not want them cluttered with what they considered unsightly electronics, which is why we began and developed in-wall and in-ceiling speakers, it was because we wanted the opportunity to be able to provide them all of that beautiful sound and incredible images, but we didn't want them to have to look at the technology that was providing it. And this is important because in every room where you're gonna have AV, you've gotta have something that's going to give you an image and you have to have something that's going to be producing the sound. Both of those physically have to reside in the room. The rest of the electronics can be hidden away in an equipment closet or down in the basement, that's fine. But 
the speakers and the screen had to be in the room. So how could we make those more attractive? Because we wanted to solve that problem for our customers. So there is our why, that's the reason we exist. We also made a determination that this individual was having a greater and greater portion of the decision that was being made in the home as to what was going on. And today, certainly, she has more of that capability than ever before. Understand that every single woman that we dealt with out there had a uh, the way that they wanted their home to look and feel. And so we had to be able to blend into that decor. Now, many people say, well, the reason that the woman is powerful is because she's just controlling the man. The man wants the technology and the woman is just looking to control the environment. That's absolutely not true. Women today know more about technology than any women in history. In fact, every one of them has a smartphone, a tablet, usually a computer. They're dealing with a smart TV or, or some type of entertainment device. What she doesn't want is she doesn't want a new learning curve. She doesn't want to have to go through this all over again. So we want to make this as accessible as possible for her and therefore for the rest of the family. And it's something that is very important to us. Now, I got into this business when I was a kid. I was 14 years old when I fell in love with the concept of hi-fi, as we used to call it back there in the dark ages. And I remember how excited I was about the equipment and what the equipment was, would do. I remember standing in front of the store window and seeing an entire stack of brushed aluminum face plates and saying to myself, oh my gosh, one day I will own something like that. And I remember the first time I bought my first system. My first system was a receiver, a pair of 12 inch three ways, a turntable. That was it. That's what I owned. And I remember bringing it home and unboxing it. And even the smell when you opened the box was wonderful. And I remember setting it up in my bedroom and turning the system on, shutting off the lights and listening to music just to the glow of the faceplate. And even when I think about that now, it sends tingles down my spine because it was such an emotional experience for me. Well, one of the things that happens anytime you get involved in an industry is quite often you will end up in situations where the stuff that you're using, frankly, just becomes stuff. And that tends to be what happens when you work with it every day. It's just another piece of equipment. We have to remember that awe. We have to remember that enthusiasm and that excitement, because if we don't, there is no way to be able to communicate that excitement to our customers. I will tell you that whenever I do a demo, I pause at the door before I take them into the theater room. And I stop at the door and I say, now, be aware that I may, in the next few minutes, spoil you for life. We're going to walk through this door and you are going to see and hear things that you may have never heard before. And you are going to desire this. I'm just warning you in advance because that's how exciting this product is. At which time I open the door and say, come on inside. We wanna make sure that as we invite people into this world that we create for them, that they understand how amazing the product is, realize how far technology has gone, and we are de delivering this to the people who are there. Now, there's also this concept of individual brands and I find it fascinating because people aren't sure exactly what a brand is. But when you think about brands that truly have an emotional attachment, that create a great enough why for people, it makes a huge difference. Let me give you an example. Apple is one of my favorites. It's the only company I'm aware of where people will stand in line for eight or nine hours in the rain or the blazing sun to get the latest version of a product they already own. That's how powerful that brand has become. There is a desire among this brand's users to get the next one, and they've done a brilliant job of that. Here's another example. Harley Davidson amazes me. I happen to be a Harley writer, and so obviously there's a personal attachment to this, but on top of all of that, it's amazing to me because Harley Davidson, I'm not gonna argue with anyone about whether or not Harley Davidson makes the best motorcycles. I mean, really the engine is a rework of a hundred year old tractor motor, so I understand. But Harley Davidson has been able to create 
has been able to create a, a desire for ownership like nothing else. Imagine a brand. Imagine if your brand could get your customers to go out and spend hours in pain and thousands of dollars to have their logo tattooed, your logo tattooed on their back. I know it's crazy, isn't it? We uh, set up a program here at Origin because we specifically wanted to do that as well. So all new dealers uh, need to go under the the needle and uh, get the Origin logo on their back. We find two things. First of all, it proves their loyalty. And second of all, they are very unlikely to switch brands as they move forward. Just kidding. That is also not my back, just in case you were wondering. But the point is, is that brands themselves have this unique ability. And again, people usually don't know what they are. It's funny how people gravitate toward a particular brand. It's amazing how somebody is a BMW or a Mercedes fan, or a Ford or a Chevy fan, or a McDonald's or a Burger King fan. However you wanna break it down, it's interesting how people make those decisions and once they have done so, well, it's very difficult to move them away for that. Now, understand exactly what the brand is because it is not necessarily the actual brand itself that matters, it's what people think of when they see it. That's what's important. As it states here, it's everything they know or, interestingly enough, everything they think they know about a particular brand. Now, I would love to tell you that I have the financial wherewithal to put hundreds of millions of dollars into the marketplace to convince people that my brand is the finest brand out there. I don't have that kind of financial resource, so it makes me very it makes it very difficult for me to go out and do that. So what I do is I make the finest product I possibly can. I then provide it to the dealers who are in my dealer network, and I then provide them not only the product but the finest service they can possibly imagine. And when they go out and talk to the end user, they are my marketing. You are my marketing. You are the people that influence the decisions of the people who are going to buy this product. There's some 300 manufacturers of in-wall and in-ceiling loudspeakers out there. We happen to be the best, and I don't say that by just thumping on my chest. We just have more experience and have done this more often than anyone else. Um, I also need to remind you of something that that is possibly the most important thing I will tell you today. And most people who sell don't know this. You see, people only buy one thing, ever. They only buy one thing. And I stand in front of salespeople. I speak to groups from 50 to 5,000. And I stand in front of these salespeople and I ask them, if people only buy one thing, what is it they buy? And it's shocking to be the number of people who do not know. They don't know what people buy but people only buy one thing. Well, somebody will raise their hand and they say, well, it's easy. They buy goods and services, that's what they buy. And then somebody else will say, no, 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 no. They buy what those goods and services do. In other words, they don't buy drill bits, they buy holes. They don't buy makeup, they buy beauty. They don't buy insurance, they buy peace of mind. Wonderful answer, still wrong. Other people will say, no, they buy the experience, that's what they buy, still wrong. Other people will say, no, they buy trust, they buy trust in me and who I am. Great answer, still wrong. If you're gonna write anything down during this presentation, make it this right here. People only buy one thing. People buy how they imagine they will feel after they bought. That's what people buy. People buy how they imagine they will feel after they bought. Now, break that down a little bit. First of all, is it real? No, it's imaginary. Second of all, is it a fact? Is it information? No, it is a feeling. You see, that's the way our brain works. The center of our brain, the actual uh, limbic brain, is responsible for making decisions. And guess what? It can't understand language. It operates on emotion. And therefore, if in fact you are trying to get someone to decide to buy a product which you sell. You have to concentrate on their imagination and how they are going to feel after they bought. Unfortunately, what we typically do is put a whole line list together of all the products and what all those products do, and we give them cut sheets with all kinds of technical information. And of course, we put together a pricing list that includes absolutely 
everything that is included in this list and all of that we put together in a big beautiful document and hand it to them with the hopes that through this incredible amount of information they are going to be able to say aha that is what I want to buy it couldn't be further from the truth please stay on the side of their brain where they make the decisions and that is on the emotional side of the brain now let me give you some history of who we are so you've got an idea as i said we have been together as a team here for about 30 years we began as a little company out in riverside california called speakercraft many of you have heard the name uh, we began out there as i i refer to it as two hippies in a hi-fi store selling audio in 1976 to anybody and everybody who was interested now this was an interesting time in history because of the fact that a lot of guys were coming back from the war over in vietnam and they were bringing back with them all kinds of audio components that they had bought while they were there. These were Japanese components that were different than what we were used to here in the US. Originally, uh, we were all using big console stereos, you know, those big mammoth pieces of furniture that everybody owned in their living room. Well, that being the case, component audio became very hot and the guys were selling it like crazy. Now, one of the things they did not like about this particular product was the loudspeakers. The Japanese were fantastic at making the electronics, but they did not really have the ability to truly voice loudspeakers, so they were impressive. So with that being the case, the guys began to build loudspeakers at the time. And they built cabinet products and they sold them and actually got quite a reputation. And then a gentleman walked in one day and asked them if they could build speakers for his motorhome. And so they did and they put them inside the motorhome and people listened to them and they said, man, that's great. And then the guy came back and said, can you make me 20,000 pair of these? And the guys kind of laughed and said, well, it took us two weeks to make this pair. I can't imagine how in the world we could make 20,000 pair for you, but they were able to put that together and they began producing speakers for these motorhomes. The, uh, the gentleman happened to be the president of Fleetwood Motorhomes, which was the largest manufacturer of class two diesel pushers in the world. And so that's where they began producing OEM product. And then there was a little company out of San Juan Capistrano that came to them and said, gosh, if you could put them in a motorhome, could you build us speakers to put in the walls? They said, sure, we can do that. And they began building in-wall and in-ceiling loudspeakers. So you understand from 1985 through 1994, every single in-wall and in-ceiling speaker sold by any of these companies here were manufactured in our factory right there in Riverside, California. About 4 million loudspeakers during that point in time we designed, built, and distributed. So understand, we've been at this longer than anybody else. There's nobody that holds a candle to us. When you look at our engineering staff, there is over 100 years of combined experience among this group that has the ability to be able to create the finest loudspeakers available. So that gives you some background so you understand who we are. Well, in uh, 94, there was a change uh, in some trade agreements and whatnot, and so many of these companies began to go overseas to have their product designed, at which time, we didn't have anything to do. And so we brought out our own self-branded product in 1994. And uh, Jeremy Burkhart, who was running the company at the time, uh, began to advance what he believed was the finest loudspeaker available. Now, everybody told us we were crazy. When we brought out our own brand, they looked at us and said, no, 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 that's not gonna work. You don't seem to understand. There's already a hundred different companies that are producing this product. How can you possibly compete? Well, within two years, we were the number one brand in the US. So we knew exactly what we were doing. We had more experience than anybody else. Now this lasted through about 2004, at which time we sold the company to a, a wonderful conglomerate by the name of Nortec. And uh, we sold it to them and we stayed on and ran it for several years, very successfully so. And then things got, well, a little too corporate for us. If you know Jeremy, you realize he's not a real corporate guy. And so we left and I thought we were retired. And then I got a phone call about three years later. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm putting the band back together and I'd really like you to be a part of it. And so we brought the engineering team, sales, marketing, the entire genesis of Origin Acoustics 
is that team which had been together for all those years. Now, it was very interesting because when, in fact, we started Origin Acoustics, we got to start with a blank sheet of paper. This was a lot of fun. For engineers, it's absolutely spectacular. They love the opportunity to be able to start from scratch and have no legacy product that they have to pay attention to. Now, we had three elements of this we were going to concentrate on. First and foremost, it had to sound right. If it didn't sound right, forget about it. It doesn't make any difference. Now, I'm a pretty good salesman. I can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. But if, in fact, it doesn't sound right, I'll never sell you a second time. And we're not in this for the one-time swing. We're in this because we want the opportunity to be able to sell again and again and again. So with that, sonic performance was critical. But more than that, we also knew, because we had spent times crawling through attics and pulling fiberglass out of our pants, we knew what it was like for guys out there to actually do the install. So with that being the case, with that being the case, we wanted to make sure that the product was the easiest product to install. And the third thing, of course, was the finished look. That's the way consumers were going to experience it for the most part. Although we build great looking product, the fact is you put a grill over the top of it and you want it to be discreet and disappear into the ceiling. So those are the three elements we went after. So I am not going to dive into absolute every nuance of the loudspeakers. But let me give you three elements that you can use when talking to a customer. Now, again, I don't want you to have the customer so involved in a technical discussion that you take them out of how they feel about the product. More than anything, I do this so that you are comfortable with the product. So when you turn to this person and they say, well, why Origin Acoustics? You are able to say, uh, you know what? Their history is so amazing. They invented the category. And frankly, they do it better than anybody else on the planet. So let me talk to you a couple of things. First of all, uh, one of the things that we went after, one of our lead engineers, Ken Humphreys, designed a new tweeter. We call it the DPSD or the dual plane stabilized diaphragm. The idea here with a dome tweeter is that normally it is only suspended around the outside edge by the surround. In this case, we suspend it not only there, but we also pin it in the dead center. This does some interesting things for us. First of all, the travel through the voice coil gap is, is much more linear and therefore it's much smoother forward and back. We want that to be as pistonic as possible. And second of all, we end up with the ability to be able to play it louder so we can balance it with other drivers and we have more flexibility. And thirdly, we have the ability to expand its frequency range. Specifically, we want to be able to roll this off lower to the midwoofer or the mid-range driver. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the reason for that is we want the capability to be able to lower the point at which that mid-range or that mid-woofer need to perform. Why would we do that? Well, there's an interesting concept, and that is that if, in fact, you ask a driver to produce a frequency, that is, the actual wavelength is physically shorter than the diameter of the driver, well, then the driver becomes incredibly directional, very beamy. We don't want that. You don't get to move these speakers around like you do a typical cabinet speaker. So once it's in a position, you want to make sure you've got incredibly wide dispersion so that you have the ability to cover a greater area. So that is exactly why this tweeter is important, so that the overall speaker, loudspeaker itself, tweeter, mid-range, and woofer, all end up with a much wider dispersion characteristic. That's important. Now, let me just show you a cutaway so that you understand what I was talking about. A typical dome tweeter, as you can see here, when you start to play it louder, certainly when you start to play it lower, it begins to rock in its suspension because you can't get that exactly identical all the way around. And eventually, you'll actually rock it so far that the voice coil will scrape against the magnet structure and destroy the tweeter entirely. The DPSD doesn't do that. Because of this point of suspension in the dead center, it actually moves in and out of the voice coil, coil gap very, very, uh, in a very linear fashion, and therefore you don't end up with that. That's why it is capable of doing what it's doing. Now, speaking of dispersion, one of the things that was important, certainly as in-ceiling speakers became more popular than in-wall speakers, our ears point forward. They point at the wall. So ideally, I'd love to be able to have a speaker that is either on the wall or standing on a stand where the tweeter is exactly at the same level as my ear. Well, guess what? The reason for this product, as I told you, the why that we created 
was because people wanted the opportunity to hide these speakers away. And no place was better to hide them than in the ceiling because people, frankly, don't pay any attention to what's in the ceiling. In fact, one of the tricks I use all the time when someone in the house, and it usually tends to be the wife, uh, says to me, well, I'm, I'm concerned about putting these in my ceiling. I don't want them to be obtrusive. At which time I will hold out my hand and I will say, do me a favor, look at my palm right here in the middle of my hand and don't take your eyes away while I ask you this question. And they kind of chuckle and they say, really, what? And I said, just look at my hand. Now, describe your ceiling to me. And they will go, oh, well, I mean, I know there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of of can lights over the couch, and uh, there's a chandelier that's right there over the dining room, and uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's that's what's in my ceiling. And then I'll say, well, Lily, why don't you take a look? And they take a look at the ceiling, and their jaw drops. They can't believe. They go, oh my gosh, I forgot about the sprinklers. Oh, and the air return, and the register that's over here. Oh, and the and the fire alarm that's up above. I forgot all about all that stuff. Well, guess what? That's what everybody does. Everybody forgets about all that stuff. And therefore, when you put speakers in the ceiling, they literally, in the minds of the people, disappear. Well, in this case, we wanted to make sure that you had the ability to be able to point the sound out of the ceiling speaker back at the listening area. This was incredibly important. So we invented, years ago, a pivoting loudspeaker. We wanted to refine that idea. In all of our three-way loudspeakers, we have this multi-motion pivoting assembly that allows you to be able to pivot the mid-range and the tweeter, which are the most directional frequencies, and point them back at the listening area. This is important just to be able to give them better coverage and better focus on the sound in the room. But it becomes even more important if you decide to do an entire home theater system in the ceiling. Imagine left, center, and right speakers across the front with a drop-down screen. I really don't want the sound coming out of the ceiling, so if I pivot the mids and the tweeters back at the listening area, guess what happens? It gives the effect of that speaker dropping out of the ceiling and being more coming out of the screen itself, which is, of course, the goal. We'd like the psychoacoustical impression to be that the sound is coming right out of the mouth of the person that's speaking on the screen. So that's exactly what this system does, and it allows for a focus like nothing else. Now, thirdly, we did something different with the surround. One of the challenges that has existed for speaker manufacturers forever is the fact that there are resonant frequencies between 700 and 1400 cycles that ripple up and down the woofer. Now, these are not frequencies that people are trying to reproduce. These are frequencies that are simply part of that woofer moving, and they resonate. And they're like ripples in a pond. They go out to the sidewall, they bounce, they go all the way back to the voice coil, bounce again, up and down, and it creates a certain amount of distortion that we would really like to be able to avoid. Well, once again, one of our engineers said, I've got a way to address this. On both the woofers and on the mid-range drivers, what we're going to do is we're gonna create a new surround. This is what it looks like right here on the mid-range driver. I'll blow that up so you can see it. <clears throat> now, it is an inverted surround, but that's not totally unique. There's plenty of speakers that have inverted surrounds. But the way that it is designed, because of the thicknesses of the rubber as it goes through this curve and because of the way it's attached to both the cone and the basket, what ends up happening to these frequencies is they run up the woofer. They actually get absorbed by the surround itself. They dissipate and they disappear and therefore do not get reflected back down to the voice coil and start the whole process again. Now, Dave, is this a huge deal? No, it's not a huge deal. It's a nuance. But you see, when you start to stack up multiple nuances like this with the DPSD tweeter and the pivoting multi-mount and all of that comes together, you truly make a difference in the way the loudspeakers sound. And that is absolutely critical. Now, again, I'm not asking you to describe this to a customer. Because if you do, more often than not, their eyes will glaze over and you'll lose them entirely. If you get somebody who's an engineer and they're really interested, certainly this is something you can discuss. But I did this specifically for you so you understand the kind of effort that we put in to making these loudspeakers sound like they should. We do not just pull drivers off a shelf and throw them into a baffle and stick them in the wall or in the ceiling. We don't do that. That's not the way that it works. Now, of course, there was the installation factor, and this changed the industry. 
listen, we invented the in-wall and the in-ceiling speaker, and we invented the entire concept of using the flip-out dogs. We got that idea from the uh, from the construction industry using single-gang retrofit boxes and whatnot, where you had those little dog legs that would flip out and tighten down behind the drywall. But the fact is, is that uh, in in doing so, in making this all happen, we had set up a format that everybody else in the world had copied. So when our engineers got together and said, we've got a better way of doing this, let me show you how this is gonna work. First of all, you're gonna take this bayonet ring, you're gonna slide it up into the ceiling after you've cut the hole. By the way, after you've cut the hole, there are no more tools necessary. Second of all, we're going to take the clips that are on the bayonet ring and we're gonna pull those down by hand and we're gonna secure those to the drywall. You'll notice that the part that actually touches the drywall is a spring-loaded metal, and because of that, it bites into the drywall, holds very securely. It also allows for, uh, or it creates a situation in which you do not in any way damage the drywall. Many times, people who are tightening speakers into the ceiling over-tighten them. They end up cracking drywall, breaking off a dog leg, warping the baffle, of the speaker itself, we don't want any of that. And this avoids all of that. Then of course, you take the speaker assembly and you attach the wires to it, and then you simply insert the speaker into the ring, you turn it about five degrees, it locks into place, and the speaker is installed. So when you are done and you've put the grill over the top, this is the easiest and most simplistic way to put speakers in the ceiling. Now we knew when we brought it out, Without question, we knew that people would knock this off, and there are several companies that have attempted to do so. Now, we learned a lot in the process. This, by the way, is about a fifth generation version of this mounting system, so we have perfected it over the years as we have moved forward. But the point is, we did this because it saves you time, it saves you effort, it makes the process much easier, and there are a number of other things that it does for you. One of the things that it does is it allows you to be able to put the ring and the grill in the ceiling without putting a speaker behind it at all. So if you end up in a situation where the house isn't secure and you don't have the ability to be able to, uh, to lock things up and keep the speakers from walking away with somebody from another trade, guess what? You can simply put the grill over the top and you're done. Now, we have a lot of people who said, well, Dave, that's a great idea, with the exception of the fact that we live in places where there have to be vapor barriers and pressure testing that are going to be done on the home because they want to secure it um, from, the, from air passages that take place in and out of the ceiling and the walls. Well, that's okay. We came up with a wonderful little product called the BC-68. It's literally a barrier that you can put in instead of a loudspeaker and hold the place for that loudspeaker in the future. Great benefit to this, you don't end up with any dead-end audio. How many of you have left wires in the ceiling in the hopes that you would come back and install a loudspeaker later? Well, guess what? The lion's share of the time, 90% of the time, no speaker ever gets attached to that wire. It sits up in the ceiling and does you no good whatsoever. Well, you put the ring in, you put this little BC-68 in, and then you put a grill over the top, and guess what? They look at this hole and say, you know what, I really should put some speakers in there. Now, if it's been a year and they've forgotten exactly who you are, don't worry about it. We left a wonderful little flat space on the front of this where you can put a sticker on there so that when they pop the grill off to look underneath and see what's there, it's got your phone number. So you can pick up the phone. They can pick up the phone, call you and say, you know what, we've started, decided to put speakers in. Now, there's a couple of other things that are important about this. First of all, in the case of the six inch and eight inch speakers, which all fit into the same ring, there are some 18 different speakers that fit in that ring. Gosh, Dave, why is that important to me? Well, I'll tell you why. You get involved in a big project and it takes a year and a half to complete. As I mentioned before, people buy how they imagine they're going to feel after they bought. Well, if I'm showing someone an incredible product and I'm telling them that, oh, guess what? In a year and a half, you're gonna to get to listen to this. There's nowhere near the emotional excitement. However, if I simply put in rings and grills, and then six weeks before they move into the house, I sit down with them and say, let's talk about which speakers are going to go into which rooms. All of a sudden, the emotions are all there. All of a sudden, people are saying, wait a minute, this is really exciting because in six weeks, I get to listen to this. Now, making that decision is very, very interesting. Also, you may end up in a situation 
where you've installed speakers in the home and you would like to be able to upgrade them before the job is complete, you can take someone into a room, you can let them listen to the speakers that are there, you can play a better loudspeaker in that same location because it only takes you a couple of minutes to be able to swap them out and then decide which one they want to use. I can't tell you how many people have done that and the people hear the better loudspeaker and say, well, my goodness, you're not putting those other loudspeakers back in again. So understand that. Also, one other thing, you now have an, a, a portal that allows you to get into the ceiling. Ever want to hide anything up there? I don't know, a wireless access point, let's say. What a great place to put it. You can simply place it in the ceiling, off to the side, away from the loudspeaker, and now you have access to it whenever you need it. So if, in fact, you needed to repair it, replace it, upgrade it, whatever you want to do, you simply pop the grill off, undo the speaker, pop it out, reach in, grab your access point, and away you go. Now, that's something that nobody else offers. It's all part of the benefit of this particular mounting system. Now, one of the other things that's fantastic is what you can get into that hole. One of the things that we determined years before, when we began building speakers, they were six-inch two-way loudspeakers. And then we moved up to an eight-inch two-way, and people went, wow, that sounds a lot better. I'm excited. And then we said, well, wait a minute, if they like 8-inch, they're going to love a 10-inch. So we built a 10-inch loudspeaker, and guess what happened? All the men went, oh, yeah, bigger is better. And all the women went, no way in the world you're going to put that manhole cover in my ceiling. And therefore, we didn't sell many 10-inch loudspeakers. It was just too big of a footprint. Well, because of the design of these loudspeakers and because of the mounting system, I can fit an 8-inch speaker into the hole that everybody else reserves for a 6-inch speaker. And I can put a 10-inch speaker into the hole that everybody else reserves for an 8-inch speaker. Now, why is that important? Well, guess what? Everybody's accepted an 8-inch speaker in the ceiling. The aesthetic works fine for, for people. And now I get to put a woofer in there that has 65% more cone area than it does in an 8-inch. I am telling you, it is absolutely and totally incredible, the kind of sound that I can get out of a 10-inch woofer, something that didn't exist before. Now, the way that that's done, here you can see the 6-inch and the 8-inch. Just to give you an idea, you can see the 6-inch doesn't take up anywhere near as much of the baffle as the 8-inch. We could have made the 6s smaller, but again, what we wanted to do was give you flexibility. We know that that footprint is completely acceptable, and being able to put both speakers in that same hole, again, gives you that flexibility. The reason that we can do that, of course, is because we don't have to leave that extra space on the outside that you need for the dog leg mounting system. That's what allows us to be able to make this happen. And also, in our 8-inch and 10-inch speakers, we lock the woofer down, and it does not pivot. Only the either the tweeter or the mid and tweeter pivot at that point in time. The 6-inch speakers, yes, the upper end of the 6-inch loudspeakers, they can actually pivot the entire woofer itself. So that's the way it works. So... As I mentioned before, I don't want you memorizing every single model number. That would be absolutely crazy because there are so many of them and it will just be confusing for you. So let me break it into size and performance. And we have five of each. There are five different sizes. We have the three inch round, what we call the minimal opening loudspeakers. We have the five inch round, slightly larger and, uh, and certainly more bass output. The threes, I would never operate on their own. Those do need a subwoofer in order to operate. The fives certainly benefit from the subwoofer as well, but I have seen them used without. Then we go into the six-inch loudspeakers, a number of those in different configurations, and then the eight-inch round in the ceiling, and then, of course, the 10-inch round in the ceiling. So you have five sizes, three, five, six, eight, and 10. Each one of those has different models that are based on the performance characteristics. Now, if I were going to build the perfect loudspeaker, the material that I would like to use would be completely weightless, but it would also it would also be absolutely and totally rigid. So it would hold its form, but it would be completely weightless. Well, guess what? That doesn't exist. That's unobtainium. You can't find that any place. So we have to make compromises. As we step up through the line, what we are doing with the materials is they are becoming lighter and they are becoming stronger, lighter and stronger. So when someone says, well, wait a minute, why would I want to buy an 87 over an 83? Again, because the materials that are being used are lighter and stronger. 
They are also more complex when it comes to the crossover networks and so forth. So we have certain voicing capabilities that we do not with others. So let me give you an idea here. Anything that ends in a 1, 61, 81, any of those models are going to have a polypropylene woofer and a silk dome tweeter. Anything that ends in a 3 is going to be injection molded graphite, IMG, and an aluminum tweeter. Anything that ends in a 5 is going to be the IMG woofer, and now we move to the DPSD tweeter that we discussed. Anything that ends in a 7 goes to glass fiber for the woofer in the mid-range, and again the DPSD tweeter. And then, of course, the top of the line is done in Kevlar. Now, many of you look at that and say, wait a minute, Kevlar is yellow. Well, frankly, Kevlar can be any color you want it to be. It could be lime green if that's what you chose. We originally made them in in yellow. The problem is if the light is shining just right off of the grill, there is a chance that you'll get some shadowing behind the grill because of the contrast between the yellow and the black uh, materials that are back there. So we have gone to a black Kevlar to be able to avoid that. So like I said, five sizes and five levels of performance gives you an idea and it's very easy. You do not need to memorize them all because when you see them, you'll be able to tell exactly what they are. As you can see, the first number indicates the size and the second number indicates the level of performance. In this case, an 85 is an eight inch with the five series components. If I look at a model 63, guess what? It is six inch, a six and a half inch loudspeaker and it's got level three components inside. But I want you to notice when you look at this list here, and it's not even complete, I've got some more to add to this. Uh, the top three you see up here are all 10 inch because they start with a 10 and there is the nine, seven and five. So the 105, 107 and 109. Those fit into their own proprietary ring because they are larger than the rest of the speakers in the line. But everything from the 89, all the way down to the 61 fit in the exact same ring. So I've got speakers that are three-way. I've got speakers that are two-way. I've got some where the, the woofer pivots and some where just the tweeter pivots. I've got dual tweeter versions of this where you have both channels being represented in the same loudspeaker. I hate to call them stereo because they really aren't stereo unless you're a hamster and you can sit between the two tweeters. But the point is, is that you have that as a flexibility, a single speaker that play, plays both channels. So I don't need to manuralize this back at the head unit and I can actually turn it into a quasi mono signal because you want to put one speaker in a bathroom or in a laundry room or a walk-in closet. So you have that. And then we go down to, again, the five inch and the three inch. Now down at the bottom, we have our producer series. The producer series are designed as contractor type products. They do use dog leg mounting systems. They still are voiced and sound fantastic for the money that you're spending for them. But if you're looking for products that are price sensitive and you need to be able to put these into uh, tract homes, that kind of thing, that's what that line is down there for. So keep that in mind. The composer collection is everything we have that goes in the wall. And as you can see, there are several of them here, starting with the largest, the theater product on the top up there. Uh, that is actually a three-way system. The woofers on the outside are different than the woofers that are in the center. And then there is the uh, DPSD tweeter that is with them. They can be played either vertically or horizontally, depending on how you want to set them up. Um, if you look down below that, the LCRs are literally the center section of the theater speaker. So you now have a you know three different versions. Many people will use the theater left and right and the LCR for a center channel. The C series that you see, the three, five, seven, and nine, all use that racetrack driver, a four inch by eight inch racetrack. Uh, that is basically the same cone area as a six and a half inch, like the CIWs that you see there, but it is in a thinner format. There's many people that like that thinner profile. So we do that as well. The CIW series were designed specifically to fill holes from other people. Remember, we formatted these <laughs> when we originally built the first in-wall speakers. We made the determination as to what the profile would be, and people have followed that ever since. That being the case, you have these three speakers for that application. Again, these are using standard dogleg mounting systems. The rest of the line of the Composer series here actually uses a snap lock system in which you only turn the screw one quarter of a turn and the dogs snap into place behind it. They're spring loaded and snap into place. It makes it very, very easy for installation and the pressure against the wall is always constant. 
Then, of course, we have the outdoor products. I will not go into this in great detail other than to say this end of the market has exploded. It used to be that you put a couple of speakers on the back half of the house and you turned them up loud and everybody in the backyard enjoyed them through the entire barbecue. Fantastic. The only problem with that, people up near the speakers couldn't hear themselves think and people further out in the yard could barely hear the music at all. What we have found and what we know to be the case is that if you put more speakers in an area, you get better and smoother coverage. This is something that we learned from the pro side of the business, the commercial side of the business, where literally the call out is, I'd like it to be plus or minus 2 dB wherever I stand inside my huge facility. Well, that's exactly what we do outdoors now. We specify because we actually do designs here in-house. That is a free service that we offer. You simply send us plans and we'll do a layout for you to present to the customer. But the point is, when you put numerous speakers and subwoofers out in the in the outdoor area, the coverage is so much better, the fidelity is so much better, and by the way, you don't need to play it as loud in order to be able to enjoy it, and therefore, the neighbors aren't frustrated by the sound that is bleeding into their homes. This has become huge, and we've got systems going in that are spending 60, 80, $100,000 in the backyard. You see, people decided they really liked living outdoors with this incredible sound quality, and that's become huge. We also do an entire series of subwoofers in wall and in ceiling, specifically for those applications where people want it up off the floor. Now, I'm gonna tell you, if I had a choice, I'd put a, a subwoofer in the corner because I just have so much more control over what that subwoofer can do if in fact I'm using a cabinet subwoofer. But there are many situations where that is absolutely unacceptable. So we build a retrofit and new construction version of an in-wall subwoofer. We build uh, both an eight inch and a six inch version of a, an in-ceiling subwoofer that actually ports into the room. The six inch sub will port into a three inch, five inch or six, eight inch port so that it can match the speakers. The eight inch subwoofer, dual eights are inside there. That one can only go into an eight inch port, six, eight inch port because there's just too much air moving and you'd get whistling if you use the smaller ones. But my point is being able to use, for example, a smaller speaker in one of these in ceiling subwoofers, you have a very discreet look. Those three inch speakers look very much like those little three inch can lights and the five and a quarters are about the same size as a five inch can light. So with that, I have the ability to have a more designer friendly product in the ceiling and still get the sound quality that I want. And that has become huge for us. Now, as we talked earlier about brands, um, I wanted to mention something to you. We do have a line of products that we designed specifically for Bang & Olufsen. Now, Bang & Olufsen is a company that has been around for 90 years and they are out of Denmark and they've done a marvelous job over the years of marketing their product as a very unique aesthetic that also has incredible audio performance. Well, they came to us and they said, you know what? Um, if we turn this project over to our engineers, we won't see the loudspeakers for 10 years. So we'd really appreciate it if you would build us some loudspeakers. And so we did. The concept behind these was, first of all, they would be co-branded. So they would have Origin Acoustics and Bang & Olufsen on the speakers. They would have a high-end look and feel to them because that's what B&O demands. And so we built them versions of the Director Series, the LCRs, and the theater product. Now, interestingly enough, one of the things that B&O demanded was that we have a specific look to these loudspeakers. Let me give you an example. This is the grill that comes with every one of the B&O loudspeakers. It is a uh, polished aluminum trim ring or a brushed aluminum trim ring around the outside over a white perforated metal. So you end up with just a little bit of bling to be able to set it apart as a Bang & Olufsen product. Now again, I spent 35 years trying to hide speakers from view. The idea of having it more obtrusive didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And then they showed me this one and they said, no, 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 we're going to make this one as well. And I said, are you out of your mind? People want this to disappear. Now you're going to call attention to it. Well, you know what I didn't understand? And that was Bang & Olufsen customers love it when you call attention to their product. Now, this, this particular grill is quite expensive. In the United States, it runs $800 a pair retail just for the grill. That doesn't include the loudspeaker. 
It takes about four hours to make out of a solid chunk of billet aluminum. It is CNC'd and then it is uh, anodized black and then all of the black is ground off except for the spaces in between the individual grooves that you see there. It then goes through a series of polishing steps so that it has the ability to have that star reflection that it gets off the center point. It is absolutely amazing. I had a woman tell me one time, that's not a grill, that's ceiling jewelry. And that's exactly what it is. So just keep that in mind. I have seen customers who have bought the Bang & Olufsen product exclusively for that grill. Now, the nice thing about it is Bang & Olufsen has been marketing its brand for 90 years. You remember when I told you I do not have the hundreds of millions to cut through the marketing messages that you get hit with every day. Well, guess what? Bang & Olufsen has been doing it long enough. They have that reputation, and we have customers out there. First, customers like myself who know it from the 70s and 80s, customers who then discovered it because it is the car audio that they found in their BMW, Mercedes, or Austin Martin, and then, of course, an entire new generation of customers who are listening to Bayo Play, which is the Bluetooth and headphones and so forth that they are listening to that is Bang & Olufsen. So, I recommend that you mention it only because you will find customers who say, you have Bang & Olufsen? Well, now I'm interested. We also produce for them, as I said, an LCR and a theater speaker for them to be able to represent under the Bang & Olufsen name. Now, let me take you quickly through the latest products that we have to offer. Uh, first of all, I don't have two models. I actually have three models of the soundbar. The SB3, which has all three channels as a typical soundbar, it is passive and it is in this beautiful extruded aluminum enclosure. Then I have the SB1, which is one like the center channel of that, and you can use it as an LCR, left, center, or right. And then I also have the SB.5, which is a single woofer and tweeter, and that too can be used left, center, and right. Um, it gives you some flexibility with layout as to how you'd like to mount these. They mount on the wall, they stand on a stand, or they have the capability, obviously, to attach to an articulating mount so that you have the ability for them to move with the television themselves. They have three and a half inch woofers, the DPSD tweeters, and as I mentioned, it's an extruded aluminum enclosure. The reason for extruded aluminum is I can make the walls much thinner than I can out of wood, and by doing so, I end up with more air volume inside and therefore more bass response. That's important. We also have the new deep subwoofers. We have three versions of it in the what in the passive version, I should say, in the performance version. An 8-inch, 10-inch, and 12-inch with an 8, 10, or 12 passive radiator firing down. That particular woofer then is either 300, 600, or 1,000 watts of power. And a new one that is coming out very shortly that will have dual 12-inch drivers, and that one will have 1,200 watts of power. Now, if you look at the back of this, you'll notice it's rather unique because there is really only the line input and the connection for the power cord. There are no controls on the back of this subwoofer whatsoever. Those controls are going to be found on a dedicated app that is Bluetooth attached to the subwoofer so that you can make adjustments. And you can adjust essentially anything you want on the subwoofer. <clears throat> it also has an auto EQ section where you can hold the phone over by the subwoofer, run a sweep, then go back to the listening area, run another sweep, and it will calculate a flat frequency response based on the rest of the system and how the subwoofer reacts in that particular room. But one of the most important things about this is that single band parametric EQ. One of the things that happens with subwoofers depend on the room, depending on the placement, depending on the seating area, you will end up with a resonant frequency in the room. It's just the way it happens. And the problem with that resonant frequency is if I try to bring the level up of the subwoofer, well, then that resonant frequency becomes even more apparent and starts rattling your teeth. Here, I have the ability to attenuate that resonant frequency and be able to smooth out overall subwoofer response, which means I can bring the level up without that offensive resonance shaking the walls or rattling the windows, and I end up with much better output. Now, anecdotal. I've got a 10 inch in my living room. My living room is large, actually it opens up into the entire bottom floor of my house and I have 25 foot ceilings. So that being the case, I end up with a great amount of air volume. I have the 10 operating with one of our sound bars and I have had to turn it down on three different occasions because it has so much output. And by the way, the low frequency extension is astounding. 
These are great subwoofers. I, if you haven't played with them, I recommend you try them. We also have uh, DS, two different DSP amplifiers. This is the DSP 3700. It is three channels, and each channel can be either 8 ohm or 70 volt, depending on how you set it up. There's 700 watts per channel, and there's a whole series of factory DSP presets that were set up originally for all of the outdoor product, for the season's landscape product, so that you can do subwoofers and satellites, and the DSP EQ will be set up specifically for those. There is also a tremendous app that will allow you to basically adjust every single nuance and configuration inside the amplifier. And by doing so, you can set it up exactly as you would like it to perform. As I mentioned, this was designed for the outdoor systems, but we've got some large indoor systems that are using this as well now. The DSP3100 is the baby brother, and the DSP3100 is an 8 ohm product only. It's only designed for 8 ohms. Um, it's not 15 watts, it's 150 watts into two channels. 115 watts times two watts per channel. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. It's 150 watts per channel into two channels. Then 350 watts into the third channel, which is designed to run a subwoofer. You remember those subwoofers that I talked about in the wall or in the ceiling? Perfect application for this right here. There are factory presets for our individual loudspeakers that allows you to be able to easily set it up. And once again, you've got the app that allows you to go inside and adjust all of this as well. This is great for the minimal opening series. It's great for the in-ceiling and in-wall subwoofers or uh, any other subwoofer that you might want to use for that application. And then we have the valet amplifier. Now, this is unique, and I'm not going to go into great depth. I've got an entire hour-long seminar that deals exclusively with valet. But what this is is an amplifier, 50 watts a channel into eight channels, so you've got four stereo zones. And on each of those individual zones, there's an RJ45 connector that allows you to power and get the audio out of an echo dot. So you literally have the ability to put echo dots in four different zones and have a multi-room, multi-source audio system that is voice controlled. And you can do that with this amplifier and four dots. There's also a line level input per zone, and there's also a global input for additional sources that will automatically switch when you when the dot is not active, it'll automatically switch over to that other source. So for example, I could have a television audio in a particular room and then have the ability to uh, be listening to the dot, and when I turn the dot off, all of a sudden the TV audio is coming through the loudspeakers. By the way, if I ask the dot a question, it will mute the television, it will respond, and then it will unmute when you're done with that interaction. So again, we can get really involved in this. Now, one of the things that makes this incredible is that we've also created an adapter so that you can mount the dot in the ceiling behind one of our speaker grills. Again, same tool as design and whatnot, but once it's up in the ceiling, I'm allowed to hide the dot behind it, but because it's acoustically transparent, I can still talk to it. And then we have this connection that allows you, again, to power the dot there and then return the audio from that all the way back to the valet amplifier. <clears throat> Pretty exciting product. I'm telling you it's having a tremendous effect out there right now. So let me wrap up for you here. First of all, why am I selling these loudspeakers? First of all, uh, it, there is no question that you as a dealer are going to see huge margin benefits where margins are being eroded in all other categories. You still can make money on these. You can also multiply your efforts. I had a dear friend of mine who used to be the VP of sales over at B&W and he and I had a conversation one day at the time, the most expensive loudspeaker I sold was $375 a pair. He said, Dave, how in the world can you make money selling speakers at $375 a pair? I said, John, I sell 22 pair into every house. At which time he laughed and then he stopped laughing and he said, you know what? That's real money. Realize that you can put speakers just about anywhere and think about the places people live in their homes. Think about the laundry room. Think about the bathroom. Think about the walk-in closet. These are places that you may not first consider, but people thoroughly enjoy having loudspeakers. And then, of course, it costs no less to put a $1,000 speaker in, or no more, to put a $1,000 speaker in than a, than a $100 speaker. In other words, if you're doing the work, the labor is going to be identical. So what are you choosing to put into that individual hole? Never undersell yourself. Realize that customers love to buy things. They hate to be sold, but they love to buy. You give them a reason and it's amazing how they'll respond. 
And then, of course, they're usually shocked by the way it sounds. And that's true because the in-ceiling speakers they're used to, they heard at the supermarket playing a thousand and one strings doing Beatles favorites. That's not what this is about. These are real loudspeakers with real drivers and real voicing so that they sound like they should in a room. And once they have it, there's no way they're going to live without it in the future, which means you're building customers who move into their next home and you're going to get a phone call. That's the way that it works. You see, the biggest difference between custom installation and retail is the way that you approach the customer. In retail, it's like fishing. You throw your bait out into the water. A, you hope there's fish. B, you hope they like your bait. And in the case of retail, it's usually advertising that you throw out there. And if we continue the metaphor, getting them to come through the front door of a retail shop is the equivalent of getting them on the hook. And of course, getting the money in the cash register is the equivalent of landing them in the boat. In the custom installation business, we don't do that. We grab our spear gun and we dive into the water. And we realize that when we dive into the water, we get to look at what fish we want to take. We know that there are fish there. We know exactly why they are there. They are for us to eat. And therefore, we are able to choose our individual customers. That's why this business has grown at the rate it has worldwide. And I'll tell you, because I spend a great deal of time traveling the world and talking to dealers, it's incredible what we do for a living. We put smiles on people's faces for a living. Imagine that. Ask any of your friends if that's not a great job. You know, the ones that are uh, actuarials at an insurance company or sell industrial chemicals for a living. And you tell them what you do. This is what we do each and every day. It's one of the most exciting businesses out there, and you get to be a part of it.